Let us be drawn into worship in prayer. Holy One, you have set our feet on the road and you meet us as we journey. So draw us into your presence this day. Give us awareness when you walk beside us. Remind us to offer hospitality to the stranger as well as to our friends that we may meet you on the way. Amen. Our first hymn is called the Pilgrim's Hymn, and it's written by my friend Landon Witsit. Was that you? Ooh. 
Brothers and sisters, not out of dread and fear, but believing that God is faithful to forgive, let us rid ourselves of what we need to carry no longer. Let us join together in the prayer of confession, first aloud, and then in silence. Risen Lord, how often you come to seek to us, and we do not recognize you. In friends and strangers who seek and offer kindness, in words that make sense of our lives and the world around us, in living, enduring promises that we have all but forgotten, you come, O oh God, but our hearts are slow to see and honor you. Forgive us, we pray. Do not leave us, but stay with us and awaken us to your presence. Kindle within us deep and genuine love for you and for the brothers and sisters you give to us. Brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Hear the prayer for illumination. Risen Christ, you opened the scriptures to your disciples and made their hearts burn within them. Open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts so we might recognize you once again in these words of scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's scripture is from Luke. Chapters 20, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. 
When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. So we are a month past Easter now, but our tour of resurrection appearances takes us back to that day. The women have just raced back from the tomb to offer their testimony. The tomb is empty, he is risen. But Luke tells us that the disciples didn't believe the women. They thought the women had come back to them with an idle tale. Contrast this story to what we heard last week from Matthew where the disciples believed the women and went on to Galilee to meet Jesus. So Cleopas and an unnamed follower are heading out of town thinking they had just bet it all on the wrong proverbial horse. They had lost and Jesus had been the one who was supposed to redeem them. He was supposed to be the man and now he's dead and his body's gone missing if the women's story made any sense at all. So much for this great plan to be disciples, to follow him around Israel, teaching, healing, sharing God's love with the world. The Bible doesn't tell us, of course, what Cleopas and the other disciple did for work before they met Jesus, but perhaps they were hoping the factory still had job openings, or maybe that their fishing boat was still at the marina with the for sale sign on it. They certainly seemed to be walking home to resume the life they had hoped to be leaving behind. But as they walk home, they talk about what they had seen and experienced, and you wonder about the stories they shared with each other. Did they remember the times that Jesus talked about his death, or were they rehashing all of those moments between the Passover dinner and the crucifixion, or were their stories the funny and the startling stories that you tell about those you love after they die? I think about those stories that I've heard family members tell at funerals, like Elaine Dilley's golf words, or Betty Perkins being sawed in half by her magician husband. Were those the stories the disciples were sharing as they walked? Remember when Jesus fed that crowd on the hillside? Yeah, that was awesome. Remember when he healed all those lepers? I thought for sure he was gonna end up with leprosy after that, that was kinda gross. Yeah, that was gross. Remember when he pronounced judgment on the religious leaders and they got so mad I thought their heads were gonna explode? Ah, oh, good times, good times. Whatever they were talking about as they walked, they thought their good times were in the past. They were not walking toward the next chapter. They were walking back to the past for a reset. The time before Jesus, the time before they thought there was a change a-coming. And then Jesus is with them, asking them what they were talking about, and they don't know who he is. The risen Jesus is hard to recognize, apparently. So they stop and they stand still looking sad. Are you the only person in the whole world who does not know what happened this week? Did you not ever get to hear Jesus speak to the crowds? Did you not get your hopes up that things were gonna be different? That the Romans were gonna be on their way out? And so they tell this stranger about the prophet they had known whom they had hoped would be the one to redeem Israel. And they mention the empty tomb. But women, you know, you know the crazy stories they tell. I mean, sure, the tomb was empty, but just like they said, but you know, we didn't see him, so. And then Jesus calls them back to that hope that they had had as they followed him through Galilee, and he lets them know they shouldn't be traveling in defeat, but should be moving into the mission of the church. How foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe what the prophets have declared. I'm hoping that Jesus also may have said, and the next time I talk to the women and give them a story, you should listen to them. But I don't know, Luke doesn't mention that. So then Jesus sets up his PowerPoint projector and pulls out his pie charts and all of his graphs and he brings his class to session and he interprets scripture starting way back at the beginning and he helps them see the very long path of redemption that God has been working out since the beginning of time. 
And like these two disciples, we too are walking somewhere after Easter. And this year, especially since we missed out on the pageantry of Easter, it's harder to remember we're on the other side of it. What does it mean for us to claim Easter in a world that has more than its share of Good Fridays? How does the life and death of Jesus of Nazareth fit into the story we're writing about our lives in these days? By the time the lecture is over, the three travelers had reached Emmaus and Jesus is walking on down the road and the two disciples stop him, stay with us. You shouldn't be on these roads at night. And my mom makes a great lasagna. I know there's gonna be plenty to eat. Please stay with us. And he accepts their hospitality and their invitation. And I want us to pause here and acknowledge that it would have been a lot easier for them and the, to say, you know, it was really nice to meet you. Safe travels. We've all done that at some point in our lives. When we look away from the homeless person on the corner instead of looking them in the eye and acknowledging their presence, or when we hear of someone coming through town, but we've got a busy week and we don't want to offer up our guest room. Jesus was not going to bust down their door and force himself into a family meal. He was heading on down the road. Listen to what one of the commentators had to say about this passage. The hospitality of the traveling companions becomes a doorway to grace. The willingness of the stranger to enter their space suggests trust and hope and Jesus more than repays their convivial overture. Hospitality expresses deep vulnerability. Welcoming a stranger is always risky, and the tables might be turned for good or ill. It is not readily apparent who the guest might really be. Jesus becomes the host at this meal, which becomes an expression of thanksgiving and deepened faith. Because they welcomed the stranger, because they were concerned about the welfare of someone they didn't know, because they extended an invitation to their table, they recognized Jesus. It's often easier not to extend hospitality, but I really try to push myself to offer it for a couple of reasons. Yes, Jesus, but also I was raised by parents and grandparents who showed me a lot of hospitality as a kid, I loved the big tables my grandmother would set when she'd gather all her friends. I have no memory of any of the conversations and I probably wouldn't have understood what they were talking about anyway, but I remember the feeling of being at a full table with lots of people and lots of food and lots of laughter and conversation. And in truth, I've been the recipient of such wonderful hospitality in my life that I wanna be able to pass that on also, I've learned when I open my home and my life to others, I end up being the beneficiary. Because the disciples offer Jesus hospitality, they recognize Jesus. And as they gathered around the table, he took bread and he blessed and he broke it and he gave it to them. Does that sound familiar? As soon as they recognized him, he was gone. And then they said, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? Their day did not end the way they expected it to. What started as a long walk of failure and crushing dream, crushed dreams turned into a greater understanding and stories shared and hospitality offered, a meal provided, a new focus for the future. The two travelers immediately got up and walked the seven miles back to Jerusalem. There's no time to waste. They meet the disciples again and then they testify to the power of welcoming a stranger, to the gift of broken bread, to the witness of the scriptures, and to the many reasons we are still supposed to hope even though the world around us gives us reason for despair. In these days, we can't gather around tables the way we'd like, not even around this table here, but we can still be hospitable. This is graduation season, and the rituals we normally would use to mark this milestone are not available to us in the same way but I've loved seeing the other ways people are celebrating their graduates. I've loved seeing the signs in the yard that the PTAs have made for the seniors, for example. Last week, I attended a Zoom graduation some friends hosted for their sons. We all wore our caps and gowns for the celebration. What are the ways we can make this world more hospitable when we can't all be together? That's your challenge this week. Take time to tell stories, even if you have to pick up a phone to do it. 
take time to offer hospitality, even if it's by calling Interface Shelter to see what the residents of the shelter could use, or by sending a graduating senior a card, or make a batch of cookies and share half of it with a neighbor. Be creative and report back. Let us know where you've given or received hospitality during quarantine, because it is in those moments that Christ opens our eyes and sets our hearts on fire. Amen. Friends, as our offering is received this day, just a reminder that you can give online at spcboise.org. Thank you to those of you who have been mailing in your contributions faithfully. Um, you can give of your lives in lots of other ways. We're also still looking for volunteers for the Bench Food Distribution Network. So, and then here are the Bell Choir Ensemble to share their gifts. Our prayer this morning is uh, written by a friend named Slats Tool called the Emmaus Road Prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, you meet us wherever we are on the road, wandering with no signs to guide us, forced to take an unexpected detour 
We're simply trying to get as far away as we can from the places that remind us of the pain, from the shuttered businesses and quiet houses and empty parks. You meet us here. And so we pour out our hearts to you, bringing to you all the mess of our lives, our hopes, our fears, our joys, our sorrows, our uncertainty about what has happened and what is still to come. Stay with us as you stayed with the disciples on the road. Come into our locked homes to be with us, to share our burdens and remind us of who we are and whose we are. Help us to remember the difficult times that we and our ancestors have faced before and remind us that we made it through and with you as our rock, we will make it through again. We share all our anxieties with you now, our worries about our loved ones, our own health, our jobs, our finances, our families, what the world will look like when this has passed and how long it will be until it is passed. We share all our grief with you now, the pain of missing the celebrations and rituals that mark time in our lives, the sorrow of not being able to visit loved ones in the hospital, the mourning of those we have lost. We share all our gratitude with you now for essential workers who keep showing up, for opportunities for connection amid distance, for the little joys we are able to find throughout our days. Help us to recognize you still among us even as our minds are clouded from stress and our hearts are weighed down with the heaviness of the world Help us to truly feel your presence above us, beneath us, before us, behind us, beside us, within us, surrounding us, surrounding this crying world. Hear our prayers, O God. Amen. Our closing hymn this day is Go in Grace and Make Disciples, 296.
Friends, receive now the benediction. Go out into the world with compassion and justice in your hearts. Give love, sorry, give voice to the silent. Give strength to the weak. See one another, hear one another, love one another, for it's all that easy and it's all that hard. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours this day and evermore. Amen. Go in peace.